You're watching In Technology, a video cast where you can get smarter about cybersecurity, sustainability, and technology. Hi, welcome to In Technology Podcast. I'm your host, Camille Moorhart. And today we are going to talk with the CISO, Chief Information Security Officer of Canonical, which produces Ubuntu. Welcome to the podcast, Stephanie DeMoss. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. So I know you from your prior career at Intel as Chief Security Technology Strategist. And I know before that you built a couple of businesses that helped protect embedded systems like in healthcare. And before that, you spent about 10 years with defense contractors doing defensive research or ethical research, which I think the rest of us would know commonly as hacking. Also, congratulations because you and your husband just published a book, and we have the link below. This is on x86 reverse engineering, essentially how to hack most of the compute systems that exist in the world. So what's the title of the book? So the title of the book is x86 software. Where reverse engineering, cracking, and countermeasures. And the other thing that I think is very interesting is not only did you write this book with your husband recently and switch to become the first chief information security officer at Canonical, but also you guys live on a farm, correct? Yeah, it's one of those weird dichotomies where we're both immensely, our careers are very techy, but actually When we're done, we both like to walk away from the computer and be outside. And we love living out on a farm. We have no neighbors. My horse is in the backyard with my donkeys. There's two of them and a sheep. And so it is just, while I love technology, I also, we both just love being away from it all when we step away from our jobs. And so, yep, we live out in the country, surrounded by cornfields and trees. And you have four kids, too. We are blessed with four kids, which means there is between the farm work and the kids and our jobs, there is never a relaxing or quiet moment, but I love every second of it. Very cool. So what is x86 and what does reverse engineering of it entail? Our goal with the book was essentially to take curious security or software-minded people and take them behind the scenes or peek behind the curtain of how software and computers actually work and then use that knowledge to crack software. So x86 is the most prolific architecture across laptops and servers. And so our goal was that learning how an x86 computer works is not only powerful from a reverse engineering cracking perspective, but it also makes people stronger developers. It helps them understand the defense better because they actually understand what's happening They can understand code optimization, efficiency, how you debug, how compilers affect both optimizations, but also the security of your system and how ultimately it also comes down to chip selection and what you want to do with that architecture. So at least for the book, our goal is to empower them to not only understand x86, but then use that knowledge to understand how if you have a mastery of that, you can turn that into the ability to manipulate or crack software. You've essentially written a manual on how to hack the world's most prolific compute architecture. There's the CPU itself, right? And so our book, while teaching you how the x86 architecture works, isn't really about the CPU or below the operating system, right? So it's x86 for the purposes of learning how to manipulate at the software level. You started off your career as what they refer to as an ethical hacker, and that I suppose it's one person's freedom fighter is another person's rebel. It depends your allegiances and where (laughs) they lie. So explain why you qualified yourself as an ethical hacker and who you were working for and what kinds of things you were doing. So traditionally, ethical hackers, their goal is to understand the tools and techniques that the nefarious or malicious hackers are doing, but doing those specifically for the purpose of driving good. In the sense that, yes, we are going to be attacking a system, but typically part of that ethical engagement is you're only researching or attacking systems that you have given, been given permission to do are in a safe state, right? Think of, you mentioned that I had done some research in the medical device space, right? Think of only ever researching a medical device that is not attached to the patient, right? It's in a research setting, it's in a lab setting. So ethical hacking is, is about rules of engagement that you know it's a safe setting, that you know that there 
isn't going to be adverse effects to the results of you testing that thing, right? You're not trying to attack an autonomous vehicle while it's driving. But then what you do with the results of it is the other piece of that puzzle is an ethical hacker's goal is to try and drive good by finding things before the bad guys do, right? And bad is always a perspective, right? Understand it depends how you're thinking of it. But in general, my goal and most ethical researchers' goals, right, is for us to find something in safe conditions and then either work with it or disclose to that manufacturer or somebody who has an ability to drive impact or change to essentially close those security loopholes before they're used for something poor. When you look at things like the National Vulnerability Database, the NVD, a tremendous number of those vulnerabilities are from research settings, right? They're vulnerabilities that were preemptively or proactively found by security researchers and ethical security hackers in an effort to essentially reduce that attack surface before bad guys can find them, right? The known exploited vulnerabilities, the KEV is a different database, right? And so if you look at the KEV versus the NVD, the number of known exploited vulnerabilities is a small subset of the known vulnerabilities in the space. And I think that comes from those ethical security hackers, right? Proactively trying to find things, you disclose them, you share them with the world so people can make informed decisions, increase their security posture, but only a small subset of those then become maliciously used or were found because they were being maliciously used. It's only been like six months or so that you've been chief information security officer at Canonical. That It's the first one that they've had. So they created the job and hired you or vice versa. You can tell us which. And First of all, tell us which. Did they hire you and you said you got to do this or did they make a position and then you applied? There's a lot of different types of CISOs out there, right? And so they were looking for a very hands-on technical one that could really like dive into the bits and bytes and the products and actually get down and you know, write code and all sorts of fun stuff. And you know, they had actively been looking and then it just happened to be a really good fit once we started talking. What is it like becoming CISO of a company with how many people are working in Canonical? We're at 1,100 people. So you're all over the world, global footprint, right? Yes, that's one of the most interesting aspects of it is Canonical from day one, right? This is our 20th anniversary, right? So this is 20 years of Canonical. And from day one, it's been a fully remote company with this idea of we just want smart people wherever they are anywhere in the world. But from a security perspective, one of the interesting things is those 1,100 employees are across 72 different countries. And so that is, it's an immensely distributed workforce. Are they bringing their own computers and mobile devices? They are currently. That's actually something that I'm working on changing, though. So we will be moving to corporately managed systems. And is that something that happens right around a thousand employee mark? Or is that not at all based on size, that more like history of expansion and scale? Yeah, at least from my perspective, it's loosely related to size. I think it's also just related to success and impact. When you think of smaller companies, you're, you typically have one product, so your attack surface is much smaller. You're not as interesting to attackers, you have much smaller real estate. It's just not that it's easy, but it's just a, a more straightforward game, right? As you start to get into the medium size, arguably you'd say you grew to medium size because you've proven you've got an interesting product. So you're now expanding the portfolio. You're probably expanding to different countries. You're expanding to different markets. And so all of that just adds immensely to the complexity. So the increased number of employees is a piece of that. But when you get to that certain level of success, the complexity just explodes. They also start to sell in more countries, which means your regulatory landscape and security requirements also changes and your interest from an attacker changes. And um, so I actually think it's super interesting to be at that cusp where the company has such a broad impact across all of compute. Actually, pretty incredible what a thousand people have been able to accomplish. And I will also say remember that is because we have a lot of engagement from the community that is open source. So that a thousand of us at Canonical are a fraction of the contributors to products. We have almost 30 different products, right? Ubuntu is the one we're most popular and known for, but our portfolio is almost 30 different products. And 
they're all over the world. What is your take on this precipice of companies, like you say, where you're toggling over? For companies who are there, what percent do you put resources towards mitigation? How are you balancing that kind of thing? Or how do you think that sort of thing is often balanced in companies at the size? Where, where should the emphasis be? I know people use this phrase a lot, but the shift left perspective, right? The more you can be proactive, the less you will have to be reactive. What tends to organically happen, though, is you start with the reactive. There is this evolution where I think that switch, that precipice, is when you start to have so much pressure on the reactive that you realize you need to start being more proactive, right? The organic growth is that as you become aware of a security problem, you fix it, you patch it, right? You become aware of a new problem, you patch it. A customer has a security risk, you patch it, right? So you become very reactionary. At a certain point, there's so much pain by being reactionary that you decide, you know what, I need to start being proactive because this reactionary is, it's not sustainable, right? If I can put effort into being proactive, I won't have to be so reactive. The proactive stuff is a lot harder because it changes everything, right? You can be reactive security patching without having to upset your developers at all, right? Your roadmap stays fine, right? You just react. When you're trying to switch to that proactive and suddenly you're upsetting the development process and you're forcing new tools and saying you can't release if there's, if this tool comes back with a high or critical, you can't release, right? That is incredibly disruptive. Customers always want good security, right? But they want their feature functionality too. And so when you say that feature is getting delayed three months because I have to do this thing that you will be transparent to you, that is a harder sell. Everyone should try to strive to put as much resources into proactive as they can, but it is also much harder. It is easier to throw resources at reactive. Is there something that a lot of companies can do that doesn't cause such a strain? I imagine it's very tops down if you're going to make hard gates and whatnot with product that's pushing timelines. That's a big pivot. Is there something companies can do in the interim to help? Some of the easiest stuff to do is the the things that are that try to balance that impact to developers, right? So when you can say, I just need you to add this tool to your CI pipeline, that's lower impact than saying, I need you to go and document all of the functions and your input assumptions. There is some balance there where there's only so many of those, right? You can throw in static code analysis in your CI CD pipeline, right? And that's great and that moves the needle meaningfully. There's only so many things that can be caught at that level, though. Tech people really don't like when you say this, but security documentation, <laughs> security documentation is so impactful and it is really not very fun for people to write. But documenting security assumptions and security controls and hardening guidelines and is so impactful because one, it empowers your customers to make informed security decisions, but you will be surprised how that is a forcing function for your development teams to realize, hey, maybe we should have added this option or, you know what, actually that doesn't really make sense. Or the, it's a forcing function for you to think about like, how would people actually use this? How would they actually lock it down and be secure? And if you can't write a cohesive story to empower your customers to do that, like that's actually really powerful. Yeah, the things that are the least impact to developer workflows but you run out of those very quickly and suddenly it becomes very <laughs> disruptive. What is the best way to manage or help a, a team of researchers, aka hackers, thrive? It's understanding those archetypes, right? Most security researchers are tinkerers at heart. They are just super, super curious people and they will do the best work when you let them follow the threads they find. They will follow the things they think are interesting and so not putting so many rules and restrictions like I need, everybody has to find five vulnerabilities every quarter. A lot of the metrics that I see people try to put on security researchers can actually be have the opposite effect of trying to get them to instead meet their metrics instead of recognizing that at the end of the day, these are just simply super, super curious people and they're gonna do their best work when you just empower them to be really curious just put some guardrails in place where you want them to at least stay in the right area. And that that also extends past like the immediate thing they're looking at, right? Understanding that curiosity isn't just 
in in one thing, right? They may be curious about adjacent products. They may be curious about some of the supply chain, right? That curiosity empower them to pull those threads because it will usually come back with something really interesting. It's right, the really best security researchers in the world that I've met. The reason they leave organizations is they try to control them too much, right? Instead of appreciating, like, empower this person to be curious and they will find stuff. How are you approaching AI? How are companies dealing with this right now? A lot of the big countries are coming out with AI security regulations. The EU Cyber Resiliency Act has some AI cybersecurity in it. There is an EU AI Act that also has some cybersecurity inside of it, right? There's US-based ones, there's Canadian-based ones. So it'll take years for those regulations to likely manifest into something at the ISO level that is potentially consistent. From the technology perspective, the technology is moving so fast that it's just hard, like it's hard, hard for me to keep up with it, right? I'm just applying security best practice. From my perspective, right, the the AI-based products, right, that Canonical produces, right, it's still, from our perspective, it's software, right? So I am still involved, like, how do we write the secure software? And is it resilient? And is there patch management inside of it? Like those using it in AI use cases, right? Then they have to actually really think about those security regulations around AI. But the same thing's happening where every country's coming up with its own, own AI security regulations. Are you using AI to actually help protect? Are you using it defensively? We are in the sense that it is built into a lot of the common security tools out there. So we are using it as like a force multiplier in detection engines and threat monitoring engines. And so it is under the hood inside of a bunch of these tools. So I don't, <laughs> I think you'd be hard best to find a security tool that doesn't have AI in it. And even the compliance tools that we're using, you can ask it a question about what was, what was the last time this product was pen tested, right? It's using AI to scan our documents to tell us that was the last time that product was tested, right? So even the, even our documentation stuff has AI power in it. So we are leveraging it, right? It is a really impressive force multiplier that we're leveraging inside of a bunch of our tool suite. What do you think are some of the technologies that are coming out now or growing that will have a tremendous impact in security? Obviously, I think very highly of confidential computing because, as you mentioned, I used to... <laughs> I used to be the chief security technology strategist at Intel. And so confidential computing is something very near and dear to my heart. I really do think it is going to move the needle in a meaningful way to that have that hardware-backed encryption of data in use, right? Isolation has always been one of those techniques that is really powerful in the security space. And I'm excited to see where that starts to go. I do think as we also start to get a lot of more of these AI-based tools, I mentioned so many of the security tools out there nowadays have AI engines under them, but they're going to start to become so much more intelligent, right? They're going to be able to ingest a lot more data than they used to be able to and make meaningful, like reasonable outcomes um, from them. So another one, like thinking of my days at Intel, right? Hardware telemetry being used to drive security insights on the system. I mean, I get so excited for what that's going to mean in the future, because at the end of the day, anything's going rogue on that system, it's getting computed on the hardware, right? The hardware level will always be that source of truth to tell that something is not happening correctly. At the software level, the OS level, it may be hiding, it may be trying to obstruct what's happening, it may be trying to make it so whatever tools you have operating at the software level can't see it, you can never hide it from the hardware. If, you, if, if the hardware can't see it, then you're not computing, right? The malicious thing's not computing. The more insight we can get into that, things like the hardware telemetry and how we'll be able to drive meaningful insight from that, I just think is so exciting to think about. Anything else? I don't want to cut you off. <laughs> I will go ahead and plug open source. So at the time, because it, while it's not a specific technology, what I am starting to see is there was this pendulum where many years ago, decades ago, open source was seen as the antithesis of security, right? From a commercial perspective, you didn't want open source because you couldn't trust it. It was just some people in their spare time in the garage writing some code. It wasn't robust. It wasn't tested, right? Enterprises didn't really like the notion of open source, right? And it started to grow in popularity 
over the last decade or so where you're starting to see more and more enterprise ready open source. The fact that I can look inside of this open source gives me more confidence, right? I can audit, I can change, right? I can do what I want inside of this open source. And so you're starting to see this paradigm shift where I'm actually seeing more sectors, even through regulation, now require things like open source. And so I'm also very excited to see that paradigm shift where now open source is seen as actually the, a really solid route forward for security. That because it's open source, I can make a more informed decision about it. I can control my own fate a little more. I can have more confidence in what's happening on the system. And so I'm also very biasly, because I'm economical, <laughs> very biasly excited about just that paradigm shift, both in, in like, you know, CISOs and CTOs and just their, their opinion of open source and how it plays a role in enterprise, but also seeing like in the regulatory space, this now acceptance and in some cases promotion of open source as being the route to go in secure solutions. What can companies like Intel do to help the broader ecosystem what are they doing well and what are they not doing right now that they could be doing? I'll put my CISO hat on for a second and circle back to the, some of the things I said before about just managing the level of complexity of regulations and trying to balance you know, what needs to be done for these regulations. So I'll give an example of in the event of a security incident, the reporting obligations it's like there's California that has a different regulation. There's the U.S. regulations, the U.K. The, every single person has their own, right? Big companies have mapped out all of these things, right? That's not competitive information, right? Sharing some of these things that just empower other companies to do the right things and meet the regulations so they can concentrate on doing like technical security and not have to spend a bunch of cycles trying to do the same thing that all these big companies have already done. So I would love to see more of that information sharing. People talk about security information sharing around threats and things, t attacks they're seeing in their network. And I think of it more around the actual infrastructure of these regulations and rules and how do you cross what those. And these are the countries I work in. So somebody's already worked all this up. So I would love to see more, more information like that trickle out because it's not competitive. I mean, it's not competitive for someone to share. Like if you operate in these four countries, here's the like 15 agencies you need to report to and here's the timelines that you have to report to them on. Like, I would love to see better information sharing like that. From the developer's perspective, right? Again, open source, empowering developers to actually be able to contribute and mess with and see. So there's both that open source piece of it, but then there's the security documentation and the security hardening guidelines in you want to empower developers, again, to concentrate on the thing they're really good at. If you have an AI developer who's leveraging one of your solutions, right, you don't want them to have to also be really savvy in AI security, right? You want them to be empowered to be successful with that piece of code without having to also be an expert in these other things, right? So just like you would spend a lot of time trying to get performance and correctness in the piece of code correct, also giving that documentation and the hardening guidelines and they don't have to understand all the attacks out there to say, all right, well, I need to turn these four things on. And if I do that, one, I meet all these regulations that I'm probably going to be up against. And two, I have done the right thing in hardening my solution. And so a lot of that sort of peripheral like documentation and guidelines, it's just lacking in a lot of software. And you're not talking at the super differentiated competitive level, premium level. You're talking, here's some basic things that really, if we could all do them, it, life would be better. <laughs> Compute would be safer. I'll be uh, <laughs> say it that way. Correct. Yeah. Like I absolutely understand the way markets were like, you want competitive products, you want differentiated features. And so it's not really an ask to get rid of that, right? That's just not realistic. It's empower people to correctly use the things you have developed so that they don't have to be an expert in it to use it correctly. Stephanie, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. You've gone from uh, <laughs> the Intel world to the open source world of Canonical and from uh, hacker to technical strategy to CISO. So you've run the gamut of protection <laughs> and defense and it was really nice. And now author. And now author, yeah, congratulations.
Thank you, Stephanie. Really appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time to talk, and it was wonderful to see you again. Never miss an episode of In Technology by following us here on YouTube or wherever you get your audio podcasts. The views and opinions expressed are those of the guests and author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Intel Corporation. Thank you.